Good. Hey everyone, it's Jim. Hi Jim, how are you? Very good, how are you? Doing well. Good morning. Good morning, Erica, how are you? Doing all right, how about you? Another wonderful day in quarantine. <laughs> yep. So I see we had a presentation on the agenda from a Red Hat team. I was seeing that myself. I'm not sure who. Uh... Yeah, I added that. Uh, they reached out to me. Uh, were directed from. Um, what's his name? Uh, anyway, they have a, it's from the IBM originally project, actually, the multi-cluster management or something. And they have a policy component and they were interested. Oh, in nice. Okay. And I, uh, and I said, yeah, come on by and then asked if they wanted to present what their project was and how it relates to policy. Cool. Oh, which they're asking me about access. Does that sound like something I need to do? Zoom should be wide open. All it, Zoom, the only change Zoom has made recently is you have to kind of log in with your Zoom account, which is just your personal account. I'm not, I'm not aware of any other. I, I unfortunately don't have access to the CNCF Zoom account. So I'm, I'm just a Joe user. Yeah. Let's see if that works. Are they uh, still having difficulty getting in? Yeah, <laughs> or they're just signing up now for Zoom. Yeah, I don't know why Zoom made that change, but that's annoying. Like. I think it was all the Zoom bombing at schools. Right. Yeah, Zoom is no longer just that. <laughs> it's now a thing. Which is pretty crazy. Hi, Erika. This is Jaya. I was able to join. Hi, great. Yeah, I know that was a little bit of a technology glitch as usual, but yeah. Yeah, sorry. They, we were just talking about Zoom added the requirement to sign in pretty recently, and we forget. <laughs> so, sorry okay. for not letting you know so you could do that ahead of time. Okay, uh, I'm going to give the same instructions to my team. Okay. 
Okay. I think we have only half an hour, right? So, okay, hopefully. I'll Do we, I think we have the whole hour registered, but. Um, okay. okay. I mean, uh, if we have other things to discuss. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, so whenever whenever uh, you're ready for my topic, I think that's good. I think I have my team on the call, so I think you're good. Okay. Cool. Um, let's check I, the agenda. Or do we have, make sure we see if we have any other little items? Do, do, hold on. All right. Awesome. Yeah, uh, so if you want to introduce yourself and talk about, you know, the project, um, or I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present in this forum. Uh, my name is J.R. Ramanathan. I am the Chief Security and Governance Architect for Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management, which is a new uh, offering uh, for Kubernetes a cluster management that we uh, released actually last week as a technology preview. So we're pretty excited about it. Uh, it is based on technology that uh, is exists originally in a, in a multi-cloud manager product offering within IBM. And we have brought it over to Red Hat and um, we have integrated and delivered it um, last week as a technology preview. Um, so what I wanted to do today was to take you through a quick intro of the overview of the product and also uh, do a quick demo. And I also have on the call several folks uh, in, uh, from Red Hat who are also working in the space um, on security and compliance aspects. Um, so why don't we have you, uh, Oz and Jacob, um, you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves. All right, thanks. All right, so my name is Juan Antonio Osorio Robles, but Oz is the shorter version, so I recommend you use that. Um, I work in security and compliance at Red Hat, uh, and uh, we are mostly doing OpenShift, so not a lot of upstream Kubernetes just yet, but uh, hopefully that'll change. Happy to be here. Uh, Jacob? Yeah, I work on the same team as Oz. I don't have actually much to add to what he says. The same team, same job. So work on this OpenShift compliance operator. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. OK. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Yu Tao. So I work with Jaya. We work on the same team, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management. I'm the main engineer for the governance capability that you will see in a few minutes. Uh, happy to be here. OK, awesome. Um, so let me go ahead and share. Uh, let's see whether it works. Oh. Okay, looks like uh, I will have to come back in <laughs> because uh, sharing permission for Zoom is not in my enabled in my thing. So, uh, so let me go back. Uh, I'll come back in in a minute. Okay. Sure. Maybe while we have a minute, uh, since we're a small group, Robert and Jim, you want to introduce yourselves um, to the new people? I think the other people they know me. Yeah, absolutely. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining. I'm Jim Baguadia from Nirmata and have been working with this group on some structure and I guess common uh, machinery around policy management. So one of the open source projects that we lead is Kiverno, which is a policy engine for Kubernetes and uh, a definition that we are proposing as part of this working group um, is to standardize or have some common way of reporting 
policy violations and also, you know, I guess policy execution reports, uh, which based on agenda we can, uh, and based on time, either we can discuss in this session or an upcoming session. Robert Figalia, I've been uh, active in the CNCF SIG security group now for, gosh, it's been close to a year, uh, helping with the security assessment uh, activities around new CNCF projects and uh, also active in this uh, policy work group as well. And uh, I also uh, have recently started uh, working with the Linux Foundation on Kubernetes uh, training topics. Okay, looks like uh, at least it seemed to work. Can you all see the screen? Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Okay, oh, good. So let me uh, go into presentation mode here. So it's just better. Okay, uh, and I assume you can also hear me. So let's go ahead and start. Um, so. Basically, um, the topic I'm going to be covering today is uh, governance capabilities that we have within the Red Hat uh, Advanced Cluster Management offering. And it is also part of the Open Cluster Management Community Project. Um, and um, so there is a way for, so that's our way to encourage uh, collaboration across uh, uh, Red Hat as well as other third party um, uh, products as well uh, and uh, third party uh, vendors, et cetera. So the whole idea of, uh, I'm sure since you're all part of the security work group, you're very familiar with these concepts. Uh, so I'll just quickly cover them. Um, so by governance, what we mean is a structured way of operating an IT infrastructure based on well-defined processes, policies, and procedures, et cetera. And typically, you know, you, that's what most enterprise clients do, right? So they have uh, internal standards as well as depending upon which industry segment they are in, they also have to deal with external standards, whether it's PCI, HIPAA, et cetera. So they have uh, well-defined policies and um, use tools to implement those policies, et cetera. And um, the R in GRC obviously stands for risk. Um, so the idea is you want to be able to identify risk areas and the priority of the risks so that IT operations can prioritize and remediate them as needed. And compliance, compliance is a very broad term. Um, it, uh, it, 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 is in, it is used in different ways. Uh, in the context of the work that we are doing, uh, when we refer to compliance, we're talking about the governance that we put in place by means of defining policies, are we compliant to those policies or not? Um, so this is more focused on, I would say technical controls and operational policies. So that's really the focus here. As opposed to compliance is also uh, referred to in the context of external standards uh, like PCI, HIPAA, FSMA, et cetera, right? So that's a different level. So there are two levels if you think about it. And uh, as I walk through the architecture, uh, you will uh, kind of get a flavor of how we address the both, both aspects. Um, so the governance framework that we have put in place, um, we have several goals there. One is we want, um, we obviously want to deliver uh, out of the box policies as many as possible for specifically the controls that we provide. Uh, so for example, um, if the OpenShift platform has security capabilities, we want to be able to deliver policies so that those can, those can be configured correctly. Um, and, uh, and obviously the same set of policies, some of them also apply to vanilla Kubernetes environments as well, not just OpenShift. Uh, but at the same time, we want those, want those policies to be customizable. And uh, so that's one of our goals. Um, the second goal is we want the ability to integrate data for, from third party controls because we won't be the ones, we meaning Red Hat won't be the one providing all the controls. So. And clients um, typically have security offerings and products that um, they already have in place and they may want to integrate those. Um, and so we do need the ability to integrate third party. Um, and then we have the overall dashboard and API for the posture and deviations from policies. And the dashboard itself has to be customizable um, for various standards. And you will see that when I show you the demo. Uh, the other goal we also have is we want the ability to add policies for different controls 
without having to make changes to our core policy framework. And that is another goal we have accomplished as well. Um, and the, the other thing I also wanted to point out here is though, you know, this group obviously is focused on security. When we talk about governance, it is not just for security controls. Governance could also apply to controls related to resiliency, could be up, applied to controls related to uh, software engineering standards and other aspects. Um, so, so the policy framework is designed in a way that you know, the policies can be applied across the board for uh, all these aspects. So this is the overall gov governance architecture that we have. So if I start on the right-hand side, uh, we have uh, three different ways in which you can incorporate policies into, into this architecture. The first is uh, using this governance uh, dashboard UI. So we have a policy UI, you'll see that in the demo, and you can go and create policies there and, uh, and then bind them to clusters where they apply using our placement policy. And uh, so that's possible. You can also author policies um, using YAML and then import them using our CLI. Um, and you can also use this mechanism called subscription, um, which is another concept we have within Rackham. And the subscription allows you to tie uh, a particular uh, store, in this case, I'm showing GitHub, um, where policies could reside, the YAML files, and then you can basically establish a channel for the subscription to go and retrieve the policies from GitHub. For example, it could also be an object store or some other repository. Um, and then the subscription can then apply those policies to the hub, which in turn deploys them to the managed clusters. So the three different ways in which you can uh, incorporate policies. One of the beauties of using a um, GitHub kind of mechanism is it then allows um, the policy lifecycle to be managed, uh, just like you would manage lifecycle for source code. So that is one of the advantages of using that approach. So those are three ways. And, uh, and then once the policy is deployed at the hub and then using the placement policy, you specify which managed clusters it applies to, the policy then gets deployed on the managed cluster. And that's the one on the left-hand side. And though I'm just showing one box here, obviously there could be multiple managed clusters here. And, um, and then within each managed cluster, you have a set of controls and uh, some could be Red Hat provided, others are provided by third party and clients. And then you have policy controllers that consume the policy and then check the state, um, depending upon what control they are managing, they would check the state against the control and, uh, and then return back violations. So those violations can report it on the Rackham Hub. So that's the overall governance architecture. So after this chart, I'll pause and uh, take some questions. So, so the overall technical approach is to open source the policy framework and the sample policy controllers and policies. And uh, this is, and the way we are doing that is through the open cluster management uh, 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 organization. So that is, uh, that is our GitHub project. And, um, and then for technical controls provided by Red Hat, we want to deliver out of the box policy templates. And, um, and then within each policy, there are uh, annotations that allow you to specify the standards, controls, and category. So for example, you could imagine um, a client, enterprise client who is in the healthcare industry, uh, they have to deal with HIPAA. They also have to deal with FISMA if they are interacting with Medicare and so on and the federal government. So when they put technical controls in place and they want to govern those controls using this FAIR framework, they want to say, okay, this policy applies to this control, but it applies to both HIPAA and FISMA. So that is what these customizable annotations allow you to do. So this way, you know, they can get um, an overall posture view uh, for various compliance standards. And, um, and this allows uh, them to continuously monitor the security and audit posture. Um, and, and then, uh, as I mentioned, the framework allows you to integrate policies for a third party. And uh, the other thing I also wanted to point out here is we really are not tied to a specific policy language. Um, so the way uh, when you see our YAML file, you will see that the specification for the policy for the control is actually wrapped by additional pieces that allows Rackham to actually ship the policy to the managed clusters 
but the actual policy itself could be, for example, written in OPA, it could be written in any other language. Um, so in fact, you who is on the call here with me uh, has authored a paper that uh, shows how you can integrate OPA policies into this framework. Let me pause. Jay, I have one yeah. quick question there. Yeah, so just on that uh, topic, and you know, we've been kind of discussing different policy frameworks and engines. So, but what is the native, you said with the best practice policies that you would provide, uh, what is the native engine used for that? Uh, so, so the way, um, it's basically our policy framework. Um, so one of the things is we support any policies for Kubernetes objects. So as long as you have a spec for a Kubernetes object, we can manage that. So that is one example, right? So we have a configuration policy controller that can manage uh, configuration for various Kubernetes resources. Um, so, but then, you know, we also have policies for certificate management, et cetera. So those are, they are defined using our own uh, syntax. You, you want to add to that, uh, what I just said? Yeah, I, I want to add that we don't really tie to a single policy engine. Okay. So, the, the, the framework we are providing is a, a governance framework and then it allows us to propagate policies to uh, to different manage to manage cluster and then collect status back so in terms in terms of the policy engine it will it we can include them as part of our policy framework and then the policy gets applied on the, on the managed cluster and and the engine deployed on that managed cluster will be execute, it will be responsible for executing that policy. So we don't really tie to one single policy engine. Okay. And do you, and these policies can act as admission controls or as, you know, sort of um, runtime policies? Do you support both modes or? Uh, currently our, our, our out of box policy are most are mostly the the runtime ones. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. You any other questions? I'm just curious. Is there a kind of a, a dry run or a static analysis uh, execution mode? So before you apply a policy, can you kind of see what the impact would be? Yeah. Yes, we do. So we do support two modes. The uh, one is inform and one is enforce. The other is enforce. So inform is kind of dry run. It will just tell you uh, what it looked like, the vi what the violation would be it, once you apply it. This this is kind of like a dry run. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I just have a couple more charts and then I'll switch to demo mode. Um, so this uh, kind of um, summarizes the governance lifecycle. Uh, so basically policies are created, as I mentioned, three different mechanisms, and uh, they can be propagated to the managed clusters using our placement. Um, one of the things uh, with respect to the placement uh, policy is you can, for example, assign labels to the various managed clusters. So you could designate certain clusters as dev, certain clusters as prod, et cetera. And then the placement is uh, you can either um, place a policy based on the label, or you can place a policy on a specific cluster, et cetera. So, so it's pretty flexible in terms of how you uh, determine you know, which uh, clusters the policies apply to. Um, and then uh, the policy controllers are deployed on the managed clusters. So the out-of-the-box policy controllers that we provide, um, they are auto-deployed on the managed clusters uh, when a cluster is either imported or created using Rackham. Uh, but other policy controllers uh, obviously can be deployed um, later, so that's fine. Um, and then, uh, like you was mentioning, we have an inform mode and an enforce mode. Um, so this allows you to kind of um, uh, decide, you know, how you want to deploy the policies. Um, obviously, you know, some of the controllers support the enforce mode and others don't, right? Uh, for example, one of the policies we have relates to uh, how many users have uh, cluster admin access. And obviously, if that policy, we only support inform mode today, because if the limit is exceeded, 
then the corrective action will have to be taken by the ops person, uh, depending upon whose access. Uh, they have to do some investigation to determine uh, why the excessive access was there and uh, take appropriate remediation. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, the policy violations, when you see the demo, you will see they are organized by the uh, standard, compliance standards and control categories. And, um, and this is very key, which is uh, other policies can be added without having to make any changes to the framework. Okay, so these are examples of some of the out of the box policy templates that we provide. And uh, in this chart, I've kind of mapped them to the NIST uh, 853 control categories. And uh, you will see some of these when I, um, when I show the demo. Um, the key thing I wanted to mention here is, though I have listed a few of the Kubernetes uh, resources here, um, the framework is rich enough that it can pretty much uh, manage policies for any Kubernetes resource. So, but I'm just showing examples here based on um, the mapping for the particular control categories. Uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight here is uh, we do have a policy for CIS, but that's currently works only for OpenShift 3.11. Uh, we are working on enabling it for OpenShift 4. Um, we also integrate with a container security operator for vulnerability scanning, so we have a policy for that. Um, so this allows you to detect uh, vulnerabilities on uh, pods you're running on the managed clusters. And the certificate uh, management uh, policy, this allows you to specify a time bound uh, within which if certificates expire, it will flag a violation. So you can keep an eye on uh, certificate expiration. Okay, so the same set of uh, out-of-the-box policies templates and mapped it to the PCI uh, control categories here. And um, this is the last chart. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a, a community project, uh, which is the Open Cluster Management GitHub project. And um, so basically Rackham is derived from uh, technology that's available there. Uh, we have not completely open sourced all the pieces. We are in the process of uh, doing so. Some of them are already open sourced and the rest will be coming in our roadmap. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this technology was, um, has been uh, derived from an existing uh, product offering within IBM and it got moved over to Red Hat. So uh, as part of that, uh, the move happened uh, this year. So we are slowly open sourcing all the various pieces with the goal to fully open source it. Um, in this uh, community project, we have a repo called uh, Enhancements and this is where we invite contributions from um, third party. And, uh, and there is also a, a repo there for uh, how to write a custom policy controller, uh, which you has uh, put together. So definitely welcome feedback on that as well. Um, before I switch to the demo mode, um, are there any other questions? And also Oz, you and Jacob, do you guys want to add anything at this point? Uh, not at the moment. Okay, uh, so one of the things, so just to, just to mention, um, I, I know the chart really didn't point out the compliance operator work that um, Oz and Jacob and team are working on. Um, so part of that project is based on the compliance as code community project. And uh, what we are working on right now is to integrate Rackham with, um, with that. So that basically means that uh, you will be able to come in into Rackham and author policies and then have the compliance operator enforce, enforce slash inform those policies and return back results. Um, the, the difference between the policies that we have uh, and the policies that we would author for the compliance operator is the two levels that I talked about, which is the current policies that we have are all based on uh, for specific controls and their operational policies. Whereas for the compliance operator, we'll be authoring, um, uh, think of it as a policy profile that actually specifies a set of rules for multiple controls. Um, and the policy profile could be for example, for FISMA or PCI or things like that. So that's the concept we are going to be inter introducing. So this will then allow you to layer uh, the compliance slash policy profile on top of the operational policies so that you can then answer questions such as, is this cluster operating to PCI readiness? 
is this cluster operating to HIPAA readiness? And you will kind of be able to say that, uh, I'll take the example of PCI. Um, you'll be able to say, okay, there are 12 controls for PCI. You have uh, governance enabled for maybe five of the 12 controls. And then for each of those five controls, here, here are the policies you have deployed, and here is the current posture. So this way, an enterprise client who is in the financial industry will be able to then tell how their uh, cluster is operating to their particular standard. Um, the other thing I also wanted to point out is the, the policy framework that we have here. Um, as I mentioned in the first uh, chart, uh, we want this applied end to end across the entire hardware and software stack. So um, the idea here is that it can, though Red Hat is going to be delivering policies for Kubernetes clusters, uh, the same framework can be used to bridge, for example, to Ansible and then manage policies for VM layer as well. And, and also, you know, middleware layers. So, um, and we have some prototypes that IBM research has done that kind of show that that's possible. So, uh, and again, done with no changes to our policy framework. So this framework is pretty rich. And um, so that's kind of the intent here is to apply it across the entire stack. Okay, so let me go to demo mode. Um, so you all can see the screen of the demo, right? Yes. Okay. So this is our uh, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes. Also, we refer to it as RACM, um, which is just an acronym. Um, so this is the console. And um, so if you go to the console, um, it actually supports three life cycles. Um, the first life cycle is cluster life cycle. So you can actually come in and you can import clusters and um, or um, you can create a cluster. Um, we also support an application lifecycle where you can come and define applications which are made up of various pieces like a database, runtime environment, etc. And then you can use placement policy to deploy the various pieces to the various clusters that uh, Rackham is managing. And then the third piece is uh, governance and risk, which is what I'm focusing on here. So uh, the governed risk uh, panel is what I'm showing here. And you can see at the very top, um, you, you see a summary that is based on standards. Um, so as I mentioned, when you define, when you first uh, deploy Rackham, actually you won't see any policies uh, because what we provide is a policy framework and a set of out of the box templates, but we don't deploy it, deploy policies out of the box. But what you do is you come in here and then you go and create a policy. I'm doing a live demo. Uh, so, when you create a policy, you come in here and you give a name for it, and then you pick uh, a namespace. Now the namespace here is the namespace on the Rackham Hub, where the policy is um, stored. And um, what is what this means is it allows you to um, assign different users access to different namespaces based on Kubernetes RBAC and allows you to segregate policies into different um, stores, different namespaces. So an example uh, use case of this is if a client has, a customer has deployed a cluster and they want to share it across multiple departments and they want to have different policies deployed for the clusters, um, then what they can do is they can um, create a cluster for department one, another cluster for department two, and then they can you import both those clusters um, into Rackham, or they could create both those clusters using Rackham. And then um, they can create a bucket of policies for department one, another bucket for department two, and, um, and they could have different users doing that if they, if, if they choose to do that. And um, this is the, using this namespace on the hub, you can enforce that R back. That's what this is doing. This doesn't represent the namespace on which the policy is deployed on the managed cluster. That is actually specified within the policy file itself. Okay. And then you can choose one of the out of the box templates that we support. And uh, this is the specification here. So as you can see, we have a policy for certificate expiration, one for CIS, and we have a IAM policy for, for the limits. Uh, we also have a policy for image vulnerability, 
And then we have a set of policies all based on Kubernetes objects um, that, uh, for which we provide out of the box templates. Um, so I'm gonna choose the certificate expiration as an example. So then when you select the particular uh, template here, the YAML file automatically gets populated on here. And you can see here for the certificate management policy, the uh, expiration time is specified here. And you can actually um, change that. So this is where the customization can happen. Um, and this the namespace here, this is the namespace that determines which namespaces the policy applies to on the managed cluster. You can provide a list of namespaces that are included and namespaces that are excluded. Um, and then uh, you can see here that since we provide the certificate policy uh, template out of the box, we auto fill in the standards categories and controls for it and based on the NIST cybersecurity framework. But you can come in here and you can add additional um, standards and essentially all the standards are comma separated and you can specify standards controls and categories and this is how you can take a same policy and apply it to multiple uh, standards um, and then you can come and click here whether you want to enforce the policy if supported so this is something you know you kind of have to check whether um, our out-of-the-box template supports enforced or not and if it does then you can uh, click that here and uh, we also have this button. This allows you to, you know, if you're still in the process of refining your policy and you're not ready yet to deploy it, um, you can come in here and uh, select this disable button, which means it won't get deployed. Um, the cluster binding, this is the one that specifies the placement. So you can, specify, you can select um, a particular cluster, which is in this case, department one prod is a managed cluster that is imported into this Rackham. Um, so you can select a specific cluster or you can select a label. And uh, so you could say, you know, apply this policy to all uh, clusters deployed on Amazon, for example. Um, uh, or you can say, you know, apply this policy to all uh, OpenShift clusters. So, so this gives you the flexibility on how you um, specify the binding for a given policy. So once you do this, um, then the policy then the policy will show up in this list. So what you see here is we have defined a set of policies um, using that mechanism. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the UI is just one way to do it. You can also just author the policy as a YAML file and import it using uh, CLI, or you can use the subscription mechanism as well. Um, so, so in this case, the certificate expiration policy has, um, there is a violation. So you can see that the violation, so when you come to that particular policy and you click on the violations tab, that's when you see the violation. And in this case, you see that uh, we have a certificate that expires in less than the time period that was specified in that, in that namespace. Um, and so it kind of shows you that. Um, another example is uh, the image. Let's go and take a look at that one. Um, so the image vulnerability policy, it is this one. So if I go and do an edit on it, you can actually see this policy. Um, so what we have done here is we have added a policy to manage uh, the container security operator, which is an operator that is delivered. Uh, it's available on Operator Hub and um, you can deploy it on the OpenShift clusters uh, to detect uh, image vulnerabilities on the running pods. So what we essentially have done here is we have defined a policy that ensures that that operator is running and it also detects uh, whether there are any violations. The way it detects violations is that operator actually creates um, this image manifest vulnerability object um, if there is a violation. So we have defined a policy, we have defined um, in this YAML that um, there shouldn't be any uh, such objects existing. So if the subject objects exist, then we know that there is a vulnerability. And um, so, so that's what you're seeing here where uh, it's basically saying that there is a violation. So when there is a violation, um, let's see, it should be showing the object name, just give it a minute here. Go back and refresh this.
Okay, um, maybe you can help here. But uh, typically what you see here is a message that shows the uh, object uh, ID. And um, I'm trying to make sure that shows up and it's not coming up here. But anyway, so, so what you will see is uh, the ID of the object, or oh, there it is. Um, there always has to be a demo glitch. Um, so, so what it shows here is this ID. So then what you can do is you can go to the OpenShift um, uh, console for the particular uh, managed cluster, and you can go and look for that particular um, object by searching it under this uh, custom resource definition. And, um, and, and then when you go into the details of that object, um, you, will act you can actually look at the violation details. So essentially what we are doing here is the container security operator is running on the managed cluster. We are using Rackham to define a policy that detects, um, first make sure it runs, and then secondly, um, if, if that, that operator detects any vulnerabilities, in which case it will create those uh, custom uh, resource uh, objects for the image uh, manifest vulnerability type, then it will show up as a violation on Rackham. And then that will then give you the ID uh, you can then drill down using the OpenShift console to get the details of the violations. So the compliance operator work that Oz and Jacob and team are working on, we are going to be doing a similar integration with Rackham um, so that you, know, you can define a policy for it using Rackham and then the compliance operator will then enforce that uh, or enforce slash inform that policy and then return back uh, violation results. I think, um, Kind of sums up what I wanted to show. Um, and you can see that in the summary, or let me look, go into the, some of the details here. So this summary can be viewed uh, either as a standard or you can view it by categories. Um, so when you view it by categories, what you're seeing here is the NIST-CSF category. Uh, for each category, you know, what, what, how many clusters are in violation as well as how many policies are in violations. Um, and you will see that both for the NIST categories and the PCI categories, or you can view, view as a standard. And as I mentioned, you can add, add additional standards here. So if I'm a healthcare customer, you know, maybe I won't be interested in PCI, but instead what you'll see here is HIPAA or FISMA. Awesome. Uh, do, maybe we can take questions real quick and then Yep. I just, yep. I, I was curious, I may have missed it. Did you say that the, the policy violation results are uh, a custom resource or there, or there some other uh, persistent data? Yeah, so that is really the nice segue, right? Um, the custom resource that I showed you, uh, that is just for the container security operator. So they have defined their own custom image uh, vulnerability type, right, to return the results back. One of the things, the reason I, I'm coming to this forum or we are coming to this forum is because we want to collaborate with you all to define a more standard way to return compliance results, right? Um, that applies not just to one control, but it also applies to multiple controls and also have a way to do that um, uh, so that, you know, we can slice and dice for standards, controls, and categories as well, right? So, so we don't have a standard definition yet, and I know that this work group has been working on uh, def such a definition. So what we really wanted to do was to contribute to that and uh, implement that standard. Yeah, that is a good segue, and definitely we can, you know, kind of dive into some details on that. Um, so one one other question I had though on the demo and uh, so when you were going through so you know the policy definition it had something about uh, enforce if available or uh, there was a label like that so what does that uh, map to and you know so I guess going back to also to my earlier question on the um, on the runtime versus admission control if some of these are applied as runtime policies. For example, um, if you're checking for things like, you know, resource quotas, et cetera, how would those be enforced at runtime? 
Yeah, so the enforce if available, as I mentioned, not every policy can be enforced easily, right? Some can be, um, and others are more a little more complicated. So, so that's why you know if available, basically means um, the whoever is deploying the creating and deploying the policies have to check whether this particular policy supports it or not. Right okay. now, it right, and then if it is if it's supported, then they can enable it. Um, but we don't uh, we don't today support it for all the policies. Okay, and if it's supported, it's again in the context of runtime definitions. What would that mean to a workload? So let's say I deploy a workload uh, in in a cluster and it's not compliant to a policy. What would enforcement mean? It will actually. Um, depending upon what you specified in the YAML file, it will revert the cluster to what was specified there. So for example, uh, you, what would be a good example we could use to uh, illustrate that? Which policy can I use? Let me uh, share again. You can, I think you can use any like configuration policy just enforce it, then it will create an object. So, so namespace is an example, right? Um, in fact, uh, let's see here. If I look at this namespace policy, one second. Okay. Let me edit it so you can see it. So the namespace policy in this case, right, it is specifying that um, there should be a namespace because it says must have of uh, that has a name prod. Okay, so if the now right now it is set to inform, but if the if this was set to enforce, then if the managed cluster did not have a namespace called prod, it will automatically create the namespace. So that's just an example, right? So you can essentially uh, specify here any Kubernetes uh, custom resource definition that you want to enforce. And it will basically revert the configuration on the managed cluster to what you specify here. Does that make sense? Somewhat, okay. So this is more like just applying, this would apply that configuration that you've set up in the policy. Exactly. Okay, I see. And there would be then, if there's some variations, et cetera, uh, that have to be handled, is there some way to then templatize that or specify those variables? Um, I think, uh, so meaning what, what do you mean is, um, so as long as, it fits into the specification of a Kubernetes resource object, then we are relying on, we'll just create that object on the managed cluster, right? And then, and then whatever the underlying Kubernetes runtime that consumes that CR enforces, we automatically get it. So what we are managing is the configuration to the Kubernetes uh, runtime. Does it make sense? Okay, so we'll just apply this um, particular configuration that's specified in this policy. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Right, that's we, why, we do, yeah, go ahead. We, we do support multiple verbs. Like here you see must have, and we, ha we also have must only have and must not have. So must have basically, it will make sure the whatever template you specified um, the the one the one that's actually created on the magic cluster matches whatever you specify in the template. Um, must on, so if for example if the template you specified here is a subset of what's actually being created on the magic cluster, then it's compliant. So must only have means it should be an exact match, and must not have basically simply means it should not exist. So this is three types of like verbs we support. Um, like unlike OP, OPA, that it, it actually provides you a a, 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 t a language, right? Program, it's, it's kind of like a program language that support, it's more flexible. So we actually make it a little bit sim 
simple for user to use. So without having to learn how to use Regal. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, you. Any other questions for us? Uh, just a real quick one. Uh, oftentimes as an auditor, I want to see not only the violations, but I want to see the explicit evidence that resources are in compliance. Is there a kind of a view or a dump of, of that perspective? Um, yeah, so right now we don't have the historical view yet, but it's definitely something in our roadmap. And um, I know you is actually actually actively working on that. Um, so the idea there is that um, when you have a particular policy, it will kind of because the policy controller is essentially checking the policies compliance periodically, right? right? And today it only returns the current state or you know whatever is the point in time state, right? Exactly. At the time it did the check. What we are also looking at is to maintain historical views so that you'll kind of know whether the compliance changed over a period of time, which I know is needed for audits, right? Which is, um, have you been maintaining this for uh, six months or whatever, right? So I think uh, that is definitely in our roadmap and we understand that is needed. And, and the other thing we're also looking at is further more, more details, right? Um, as opposed to just saying, uh, compliant and non-compliant, being able to have some additional details on, on the, um, the policy itself, et cetera, uh, which are all needed for audits. So, so the audit evidence collection is something we will look at uh, in our roadmap as well, but our initial focus is more on ensuring that the clusters are configured properly, right? For best practices and uh, providing that visible visibility view. So that's the first, then we want to get to historical stuff and then thirdly get into more of the audit um, evidence collection. Yeah, Great. Just, hopping in, uh, just hopping in real quick because I think it's really relevant what was uh, the, the question that RF, I don't know who that is, but. Robert. <laughs> Robert, right, that Robert presented, uh, that, which was my main concern with the proposal. Uh, I mean, Erica pointed it to me some time ago and the only thing that besides wanting to look at more use cases the only thing that in my opinion is lacking from the proposal not rackham but i mean the proposal for the object uh that's going to represent policy violations is that exactly that a lot of the times you don't really care about just the uh what failed in a policy but there's more states to it Right. Usually you have like an informational warning or informational uh, message. Oftentimes we'll have that the policy passed and so on. So the way that we went around this, I mean, we have a, a yet another operator that does policies and like I could maybe in the next weeks explain about it because it's, it's its own separate thing. But uh, the way that we addressed it is by having something called the compliance check result. And that contains uh, both the severity of the check, uh, the, uh, what do we have? Severity, the status, if it passed, fail, errored out, was not checked, was skipped. And, uh, and I don't remember exactly how many states do we have, but uh, I mean, I could present actually what we have real quick. Let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, desktop, uh, there you go, share. Just something super quick. Uh, do you see my screen? Yep. Yes, we do. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Gonna remove this one and there we go. So OC get uh, compliance check results. So I, I ran, I was working on this and I ran a scan and it's just gonna tell me everything that happened for the cluster, right? So uh, audit rules are failing in this cluster. Some uh, audit configuration is passing and so on. Ultimately, what I do want is to know what failed. So I can see that effectively. Uh, in this case, maybe I want to check this specific rule. Uh, in YAML format, please. Thank you. 
uh, and this is basically what we have currently, right? The severity, uh, status, uh, what was the suite? We have a concept of compliance suites that run a bunch of checks. What was the suite that triggers this check? Uh, it has a name. Uh, what else does it have? Yeah, that's basically it's severity, status, some identification that is gonna appear in your compliance document or your audit results and a description of what was done there. Right, so that having something like this would be really useful. We could easily just migrate to whatever you guys have, but ultimately it's something a bit more flexible than just violations. Right. Yeah, so there is, um, not sure if you got a chance to see this, Oz, but there is a new version of a proposal I just shared on the channel as well as I put a link in the agenda, um, oh. which- Can you, know, you share the agenda? Because I didn't get that link somehow. Yeah, I can, and I'll share the link again too. Um, just to kind of quickly show what, so this is more like taking into, so I started updating the other document, but then figured it was just easier to write a new one because there was just too many different comments and changes to manage in, in the Google Doc. So this proposal um, takes so some of the main comments we got in addition to what you mentioned to provide a way to, um, you know, not just capture the violations, but even the uh, results in terms of which policies were applied, what time, things like that. Um, also provide some flexibility in aggregating these results. I think there was another comment um, from, uh, I think somebody else at Red Hat, right, Erica, if you, um, on, on aggregating these for like nodes, um, so that was uh, this this new proposal allows aggregating results uh, at different levels, and, and then also you know be have more flexibility in terms of other custom data that we might want. So just to quickly show an example, and I was just trying to map it to let's say you want to run a CIS Kubernetes CIS benchmark, right? Um, and what's interesting in this case is there's, it doesn't relate exactly to a Kubernetes object or resource but it's relating more to components and the control plane and the worker nodes, so on. Uh, but the idea here would be to keep this reporting mechanism flexible enough to cover that, as well as I took another example, this is more for a workload like uh, from Kiverno, where we're just reporting failures uh, for pod security, right? So again, the, you know, the, we're just showing a failure here but the idea could be that you could also add success results like which checks actually passed and for each you would have like a pass fail warn info uh, and we can customize the categories so anyways i know we're coming up on time but uh, would be great if you want to take a look and we can uh, you know exchange ideas on either the slack or uh, if you want to set up even a separate meeting before our next uh, bi-weekly meeting happy to do that because I think this would be good to hammer out and come up with something which is flexible and reusable. Um, yeah, for from different frameworks. All right, that sounds a bit more like what we were looking for. So I'm gonna take a look at that and comment as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Because we're running low on time. Um, and if we do have a lot to discuss, we used to meet, meet, meet weekly and then we moved every two weeks. Should we move back to weekly while we have lots of agenda items? Since we kind of ran out of time today. Thoughts or is it two weeks okay? Are we not that rushed? So I think if we can, you know, just maybe get get comments and make progress even outside of these meetings, that may okay. be better, right? Because um, I think on Slack or something. And every two weeks is a good rhythm to kind of aggregate those. Sessions. Right. Okay. Yep. I think that sounds great. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I posted the link here, and you know, again, like in the Slack channel, I'll also add the link again to, and the agenda uh, for the meeting has that. So definitely, let's uh, let's discuss more, and then uh, maybe by the time we have the next biweekly meeting, we'll have a more uh, sort of. Uh, finalized version and we can even draft up a CRD for it. Uh, Sounds great. Uh, could you, uh, Jayashi, could you add links to your project in the uh, agenda notes 
and if you have, if the slides are public, that'd be great too. Uh, I linked to the agenda in the group chat. Okay, did you? Yeah, there I see it. I'll do that. Thank you. All right, I'm super excited to see the, are, do we change the name now? It's policy report. <laughs> <laughs> right, because it's no longer just violations. So um, yeah, and of those suggestions for better names, of course, we could uh, augment that. Well, no, it's policy. We need to make it sound very bland and <laughs> right. bureaucratic. No, this is, I'm really excited. Um, again, you know, uh, glad to get hooked up into this um, work group. And uh, I think the work is very timely because we are trying to, like I said, integrate this um, compliance operator and rack them together. And uh, this is something we have to do. So it'll be great to make it a standard. So, you know, we're not right. doing in proprietary. So it's, it's great. Absolutely. Sounds good. Thank you for the presentation. That was awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, everyone. See right. you in two Take weeks. Care. Bye. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.